We've taken out everything really, and um, it just had to be done. Welcome to Free Range Sailing. For those of you that are new here, our boat Marul is a Clansman 30. She is a fiberglass 30 foot masthead sloop built in New South Wales in 1969. Troy bought her seven years ago in Cairns and sailed her around the top of Australia all the way to Perth. Three and a half years ago we sailed north from Perth to circumnavigate the Australian continent together, filming our cruising adventures and attending to any essential maintenance along the way. We are currently in lockdown in Tasmania the southernmost part of the continent, where we've decided to carry out a long overdue refit. If you want to be notified of all our weekly refit videos over the coming months, make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button. When you've got some varnish to get off some timber work, a lot of people think that the only way to do it is through sanding, and that takes a long time and it makes a big mess. But if you have a heat gun, you can actually speed things up and make your life a little bit easier. We've covered this before in another video, but it was the dinghy refit, so some people might not have seen it. <laughs> and just heat it till it just starts to bubble. So that varnish was in pretty poor condition. Lots of gaps had worn away and things like that. So it was coming off in small sections, but it was still pretty quick uh, what we did. But oftentimes when you've got a nice thick um, varnish coat but you just want to remove it, when you hit it with the heat gun, um, it'll often come off in one big ribbon. Before I cut them out, I've just been um, grinding away the paint to get back to the parent glass, or, and that means when I glue the next lot in, um, I'll have a I'll have a reasonable surface to, to to resin in the next board. It's probably less fun than it sounds, actually. But now what I'm going to do when I'm when I'm cutting this out, I want it to be um, of a uniform distance away from the edge of the boat where I'm cutting it out and I'll show you what I mean. So I'm going to use this, it's about an inch out. I felt under there and the fillet, you know, the, the glass chamfer that holds this in place at the moment is just under an inch. So if I go an inch out, I'll get a nice, a nice shelf of a material that when I put the next bed in, it will sit on there really nicely. As I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm not butting it up really, really hard. It's just where the flat part is. Where it goes flat, and there goes the line. Flat. There it goes. So I've marked all my lines in using this as just a spacer. And now I'll just join them all up. I've got this little bit of plastic. The reason I'm going for a short, um, a short bit instead of like using a long straight edge is because along that surface it'll be curved and it'll be okay just to do a series of relatively straight cuts. For working in confined spaces, and it's not the quickest option, but I do like these multi-tools um, with a tooth blade. One of the good things, um, like I said, it's not the quickest option, but I'm going to be quite cramped in there without a lot of um, room to move. And the nice thing about these See that? No injury, no blood, nothing missing. Your skin moves. <laughs> so those little teeth, they can't, you know, your skin moves beyond the range of one, what one of these multi-tools will do. So even though there would probably be more efficient tools, this thing I can get in there with it and it's not going to throw loads and loads of dust into the air. And more importantly, there'll be no kickback, there'll be no risk of me suffering any sort of injury. That's kind of important. Disgusting. 
So it's the beginning of week three here at the marina. We're in the depths of our refit and uh, we're still sanding. Let's show you where we're at. The boat looks really Eddie. spacious. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. Like it's we, We've taken out everything really and um, it just had to be done. We've scraped all the loose paint off. So I've got my random orbital sand here with some 40 grit. <laughs> Once again, a soft shackle. So I've just put it like that. And it sits there. And once you turn the vacuum cleaner on, of course the suction holds it onto there really well and it makes a massive difference to the quality of the air and the cleanup. Having said that about the quality of the air, it doesn't matter, it still gets pretty thick in here. And noisy. Ready to go. Okay, so here I am in the car with pretty much the last of our stuff from the boat. We're in the final stages, stages of sanding. We've sanded the forward um, cabin, the forward V berth. We've sanded the quarter berth. Troy is busy, busy sanding the saloon, galley, kitchen area right now. I'm going to put this stuff into the storage space. We've been lucky enough to have this storage shed um, while we've been refitting, which is just awesome. There's kind of a faint smell in here of like old cooking oil because I really need to get stuck in and clean our stove. And I'll show you in a minute how corroded the burners are. Okay, so as you can see, our stove is in a pretty bad state. Corroded away, copper. So yeah, we're gonna replace these guys. After I'd removed the broken burners and grill, I gave the stove a good clean with washing up detergent. I then used some 1200 grit wet and dry sandpaper to remove any remaining marks and scratches from the metal. So we've got to this stage, I've heat gunned and stripped paint off, um, I've used the orbital sander and the little detail sander um, to get just about everything off that was anywhere near flaking or you know, not substantially holding on. So the rest of this stuff is pretty good. But now um, I'm just going to go through with some 80 grit, just hand sanding paper, because machines are, are great on a, flat, on a flat surface, but behind me has got lots of divots. It's quite rough finish, the old Klansman. So I'll go through and hand sand now, um, and I'll be wearing my glasses because that is a great time just to have a scraper handy as well and any paint that's any little flecks or anything like that I'll just nick them out um, and sand it because any small bits of paint that are, you know, aren't absolutely sticking to the, the fiberglass they'll weaken the future paint job. So I've gone to this amount of trouble so <laughs> it's worth just going over just um, a little bit further. So this paint here is you know that's it's still really sand and it's sticking on there well I've, I've given it quite a bit of a hard time. So just making sure that all of the edges where they join the rest of it is just feathered so there's no so you can't feel it with your fingernail at all there's no transition and that should be fine but we've uh, it's taken about three weeks to get to this stage all right and the reason being the reason it takes so long when you are renovating a house there's a lot of just flat surfaces okay and they come to nice clean corners and then there's some little fiddly bits on a boat it's just about all fiddly bits <laughs> you know like there's lots of nooks and crannies and all around these bolts and everything um some of them you know i've taken out but you you've got to get in around every single one of them the galley's going to get um a little bit of a birthday in that we've ripped everything out and um there was opening drawers but only very small apertures to get inside and what that meant is it's, it was very hard to clean but if we look at where i ripped it apart now We've got a few ideas to add some more drawers to, to the whole thing, but I want it so that we can get in there and clean it and service the systems that are hidden behind. There's not many on the rule, but what is there, I want to be able to clean it and I want to be able to service it easily in the future. 
these things hard to get when there's a, a viral pandemic and <laughs> you want to do rugby. So we can see this is where the electrical box used to be and part of the reason for its size was to cover up the back of this. So we've got this enormous wiring loom coming from the engine and this is the old instrument panel. We've got the, the back of the tachometer and there's a few alarms. So the tachometer has pretty much stopped working which means that all of this is pretty superfluous because I can, um, I can just go and get new piezo alarms and lights to set up to um, warn me when the oil pressure and water temperature are bad and I can put gauges with those. And with the tachometer they're really quite expensive and normally I operate on sand anyway but I'll get an hour meter because knowing how long the engine's running is fairly important. Um, so this panel here is going to go, the, the way it was mounted it was open to the elements and it was sort of not ideal but you know, you're limited on a small boat for space. So this is going to go and this jagged hole here, <laughs> um, we're going to glass that over. So most wiring looms are usually attached to instrument panels by these sort of uh, plugs and they're all sort of a little bit different in how they work but normally they'll all have a bit of a, a clip that you disengage and then they'll just come apart. And you can see that that just makes things easy to, to pull away and service and then reconnect. So what I'm going to do, because I want the alarms that are still, um, still working to be able to reconnect, I'll just undo this and then when I pull it back out I'll reconnect it and that means the boat's not disabled. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. see that this is a pretty irregular hole so what I'll do is I'll just um, get a bit of a cardboard box <laughs> put it in behind here and trace around it and make a template. Making a template for things is just about the best way you can always go and we'll be doing a fair bit of that here so with this one just a bit of cardboard should suffice and I've got some scissors then I can just lay that out on some old ply and we can fill this hole. The other thing I might do before I continue further on is to put on uh, put on these overalls because it's still quite dusty in here. We haven't done we haven't done the, the pre-paint cleanup, and that's going to be involved as well, you know, because you want to get all the dust that you possibly can. And what we'll probably end up doing there is just we've got a whole bunch of disposable paper towel, and we'll be wiping everything down, vacuuming, and everything else like that. You could always wash it down if you wanted to, but then that, that water would have um, you know, paint dust and stuff like that. Where's that going to go? So it's one of, the, one of the things about yacht ownership is um, you are often dealing with some waste products when you're doing refits and even yacht construction. You really have to give it some thought as to what you're going to do with that stuff if you want to proceed at all, a lot of the times we'll, we'll try not to do things if it's going to you know, be a really polluting sort of thing. But at this stage we just really had to get that paint done, so there's going to be some impact. Let's see what we can do to minimise it. I'll just mention something uh, quickly because I found here is at some point in the past there was, must have been some gauge or something like that. And this has just been repaired by putting in a thickened epoxy plug. And that's really common on boats. And, you know, usually what happens is just a, a plug is put in and then painted over. But they don't really do much <laughs> unless they're glassed both sides. Just putting the plug in itself, it does fill the gap, but it's not particularly strong. Not so great, huh? Now, 
that plug would have been just fine to fill that gap, but where the strength comes in is grinding this and then putting layers of glass over. We can see also where I just knocked that out. It's still got the old um, Sikaflex of whatever waterproof the gauge was that was in there. It's one of the things with secondhand boats that you'll find repair jobs like this, and we can we can see there that it's just ply was cut to shape of a gauge that was pulled out, and then some epoxy was just thickened up. It probably wasn't even epoxy, just some resin was thickened up and just dabbed around, and it was glued in there, and then it had some layers of paint go over, and there's had a few repaints there, so there's some primer and some top coat. No glass at all. Sometimes in old boats you can have old repairs there. This this was not in a critical position. But sometimes in old boats you have to keep your eye out because there has been some repairs done and cosmetically they look good but they're they're not particularly sound. For that for that repair I guess the person that did this just quite rightly just thought you need to keep the weather out but it always pays to try and make things a bit strong <laughs> because it is a boat. So so we'll do that, but I'll I'll just use that to trace out. Oh, I, I won't, the reason I just won't bang this back in and reuse it again is because there's quite a bit of goop there and I want the fiberglass to get good adhesion so I'll use um, ply. So I'll just use this to trace around and cut out some ply. What we're going to put in here, that filler, it isn't actually what's going to give it the strength, it's the glass that we're going to put on the fiberglass, a couple of layers on either side. To illustrate what I mean by that, like there's a lot of boats now that are made with a foam core. Um, and that foam's not particularly heavy and it's not particularly strong, but once you put fiberglass on both sides of it, it does become very strong. So we can fill this in with a bit of ply or e even PVC foam if we wanted a material that was easier to work. Um, and then once we've got fiberglass on both sides of that, it will be strong, you know, certainly strong enough for this application. Most waves are coming this way. If a, if a huge, huge wave came and um, smacked this one, you'd probably be a bit more vulnerable on your hatch surrounds and, and things like that. Because once we get a, you know, a good inch and a half of overlap of glass here and a couple of layers front and back, that'll be, that'll be surprisingly strong. So the strength isn't coming from what we're filling in here, because that, that'll just be glued in there. It'll be reasonably strong, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be nearly enough. But once we glass over that, you'd be, you'd be surprised how strong that actually is. Now there's a bunch of holes that I want to fill with thickened epoxy. The best way to go about that is turning those holes into, if you were to look at a cross section, into a bit of an hourglass. So that means we're going to have to chamfer the edges in and out. And my favourite tool for doing it is this little V groove cutter that actually <laughs> it's a router bit, but it does a really good job on these holes of just giving us a nice cone shape entry. You could use a countersink bit if you wanted to. But this doesn't have a this doesn't have a drill bit to get in the way. So we can see by doing that that we've opened up to clean timber, virgin timber, and the epoxy will just grip that really well. It won't be gripping onto old paint or anything like that. So once we plug those with thickened epoxy, it'll be fairly strong anyway. Um, but quite a few of those will be in the, the glass overlap area, you know, when I, when I put a sheet, some sheets of glass over it. So they'll be super strong. It, they, they won't even really come into it, but I do need to patch them up with thickened epoxy before I do my fiberglassing, because you can't really have um, pockets of air under your fiberglass. That's a, that's a weak point that will fail later on. So that's about as easy it gets for making a template. So we just have to like get something to fill that hole. It can be foam. We've got some ply that we took out of the boat. I, I wouldn't mind reusing that. Um, you know, otherwise it's just going to go to landfill. So we'll fill that in, and then I'm going to get some. I'm going to use epoxy, thicken that up as a glue. I like to use epoxy because it sticks to just about everything. Polyester resin is cheaper, and it's fine for when you're doing initial layup and boat building and things like that. But when you need to do repairs to a boat, I prefer to use epoxy because it sticks to just about everything. Now we don't have a jigsaw with us or any sort of little power tool that I'm going to be able to do this with. 
we have been offered um, workshop space by some friendly people here, but just for this little stuff, we'll just use the handsaw that I normally carry around, and that'll probably be a bit more closer to um, cruisers' experiences as well. We're just using this um, this old ply. We just hung onto it, just reusing unwanted stuff because I'm going to recut a new one of these if we if we do recut it at all. So I just strip some of the, the varnish off it with the heat gun very quickly. We'll put this into place and then when it comes time to put um, to fiberglass this then we'll sand it again. These poor old little palm planes. <laughs> Same bit. Game. Does the block fit? Good job. So you can see a fair bit of daylight around that, which is by design because you want to have the, the epoxy glue in all of those gaps. You don't want it sort of only just a thin smear of it. So there we go. Just have some sort of marking so you know what's what because these are not symmetrical obviously so it saves you a little bit of you know, having an aptitude test once this is all covered in epoxy. So I think we'll use a bit of hot glue for that yep. until the epoxy sets because that one's fairly loose and this one's very loose. I'm sort of limited for cutting these just to what the, the size hole saw I have. Having a hole saw is one set of tools that I would say on a boat is almost compulsory really. A, a good set of hole saws. <laughs> it seems funny on a boat that you'd want to put holes in it, but it's actually surprising how many times you actually want to do that for putting in valves or running conduit or making an insurance claim. So we didn't make up a ton of it, did we? No. But when you do make glue with epoxy, it does it does pay to put it out on a pallet and spread it around so it can so the heat can escape because if you have it all confined, it can build up its own heat mm. as a chemical reaction um, and it might set it off. It does remind me of baking, hey. I bet if you're a good baker you'd be a good fiberglasser. Mixing, measuring, stirring. And then, like this is like icing. I think those um, I think those skills are just cross compatible with living, mm -hmm. with good living, aren't they? I don't know. I wouldn't have thought like neatly icing a cake was a useful skill, but there you go. There you go. I've been proved wrong. <laughs> So you can sort of see why it's a good idea to get all of this sort of thing done. Um, we've done all our preliminary sanding, but we haven't done a big clean up yet, have we? No. Because we're going to be doing more sanding. <laughs> sanding. Get the further glue down. So because that's hot glued in there now, look, I can be pretty I can be pretty rough on this of just sort of jamming that stuff just in the gaps. Before I put glass on, I'll just put a fairing, um, I'll just put a, another coat look, with fairing compound, so a different type of mix going into the into the epoxy resin, which is much easier to sand. And the, the only reason I'll do that is not necessarily cosmetics, but where you have a little jump up. Fiberglass doesn't necessarily like that. It likes really super smooth transitions. So we'll put some glass on and then another fairing coat and this, this repair will just disappear. So that hot glue, look at that. She's nice and steady now. So we'll just... Fill that in? Yeah, but I can be, I can be pretty firm with it now, whereas before I would have needed 16 hands. 
Okay, so those two patches, they're all sanded up. Um, no risers, no little voids or anything like that for, for air to be trapped in when we glass it up. I'm going to take this, it's about 135 gram glass. I'm going to cut it to the, the shape, you know, the size shape that I want to cover the patch. Um, two layers, I'll weigh that, and then what the weight of that is, I'll add another 20%, and that's about the weight of the resin that I'm going to use. When I'm working with fiberglass, I do like to work on any other surface except white. So a little bit of contrast definitely helps. A cheap chip brush is used to wet out the patch and the layers of fiberglass with unthickened epoxy. A roller or consolidator was then used to remove any air in the layer. The old compass in our cockpit was faulty so we removed it and filled the hole using the same method. A tail of two rollers. I've had this one for a while, not that happy with it, it started to bind up, cheap as anything. This one's slightly more expensive. The experience of, you know, the difference in experience of using these two things, just pay that fraction extra, do yourself a favor and get one of these because what happens is like this has to roll over the glass. If it doesn't, if it stops and binds a little bit, it'll pull the fiberglass and that resin will act as a, a little bit of a lubricant and it will pull and it will muck up your work. This went just so smoothly, it was just such a pleasure to use. It was well worth, just like any tool, it was well worth the, the bit extra I paid just for the, just the, the experience, the aesthetics of it, if you like, of working with it. There's a lot of cheap tools out there and you know, some people really go for it, they, they like to save their money, but our point of view is that when we're using them, we really like the feeling of using good tools. So we'll tend to just pay that little bit extra. Um, but then, of course, once you have them, they're not disposable, are they? You, you've got to look after them, which is a good thing. It's Saturday, so I might just get off the boat because the only thing that's going to cause any extra chaos is, of course, me. So if I, I can probably get a lot of problems, um, I can save a lot of problems just by getting out of the way, letting that resin cure, because there's nothing worse than having a glass job nearly set up and you bump into it. The last step is to coat the fiberglass with epoxy mixed with Q-cells or microspheres. This gives a filler that is easily sanded to a smooth finish. If you enjoyed this week's video, thanks for giving it a like. Thanks for joining us this week and we just want to thank all of our friends in Tasmania that we've met and have lent a helping hand. We really appreciate it and we couldn't have done it without you.